Welcome to the Careers by Jen podcast, episode 198. This time on the podcast, Jen interviews Christy Sumer on why a minimalist work wardrobe can de-stress your life. I de-stressed my life last year by eliminating a major daily wardrobe decision. I bought 365 identical shirts, so I never have to wonder what shirt to put on in the morning. Can you imagine anything simpler than that? You're listening to the Careers by Jen podcast with me, Jen Swanson, the podcast that helps you to get the job, love your work, and advance your career. Your closet is jammed full. There are things in there you don't even remember acquiring. You try on multiple outfits and you spend way too much time trying to figure out what to wear each day. Precious time. Time that you could be doing something else, something more interesting. Well, my guest today is Christy Sumer, founder of the clothing company Encircled based in Toronto, Canada, and I began by asking Christy why, how much, or what you have in your closet has anything to do with your stress levels. Find out her response after this. Are you procrastinating? Do you want to start a job search but aren't quite sure where to begin? Is it all just a little overwhelming? At Careers by Jen, we have a five-day jumpstart your job search challenge to help you get unstuck and move toward finding your dream job. Every day for five days, you'll receive an email to your inbox that asks you to complete one task. Every task you complete moves you closer toward your goal. The best part about this challenge is that it's absolutely free. Come over to careersbygen.com and you'll see the five-day jumpstart your job search challenge on the right-hand side of the screen. Click on the image of Jen, sign up with your email address, and you'll be five days closer to reaching your goal. Why wait when you can get busy? Visit careersbygen.com after this podcast. So today I'm speaking with Christy Sumer from Encircled. And Christy, I'm going to start with a question I'm going to ask. Uh, well, first of all, that we're all pretty stressed these days. And my question is, how does how much or what you have in your closet have anything to do with your stress levels? Great question. So what we found through speaking to our customers is that we're only wearing about half of what we have in our closet. There's a lot of like clutter in our closet taking up space and so just that alone makes it very difficult to get dressed in the morning so when you go into your closet and you're you know it's like seven in the morning and you're trying to figure out what to wear when you have like basically double the stuff and you're not wearing most of it it can be very stressful because you can't even find what you love wearing because your closet is overstuffed so I really see that as being a stress point is like when you have less in your closet and you kind of know your style and you know what you love to wear and what looks good on you and what you feel most confident in, then you can take the stress out of your day a little bit. That's great because I know this past summer I, I had stumbled across, and it may have even been on your website, the term capsule wardrobe. And I thought, mm-hmm. what is this thing that everyone is talking about? And is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about a capsule wardrobe. People call it many different things. So here I mentioned it's like a minimalist closet or, yeah, capsule wardrobe or capsule collection. Um, and generally what it is is basically a group of, I think the ideal number that a lot of bloggers talk about is like 33 items in your closet that you can kind of mix and match and wear together to get multiple outfits. And it's kind of that idea of uniform dressing. So coming into and figuring out what your style is, what your kind of core go-to outfits are and just kind of putting on a repeat and making sure that you have a closet that not only is versatile but has color of color palette that goes well together, texturally goes well together, dresses up, dresses down, um, that you have a lot of embedded kind of elements that give you a lot more in your closet with a lot less clothing. I can see that because I remember, you know, and it's still happening because I'm not there yet, but it's figuring out what goes with what. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. That, that's a huge challenge for sure. Um, and definitely I found myself personally, I'm not much of a, I'm not like a fashionista, so I don't consider myself like the most stylish person in the world. 
So for me, a lot of it has been about researching what like vibes with me from a style effect. And one of my best tips I have for um, our customers and I use myself as well is to create like Pinterest boards for a style that you really like. And so when you're looking for what can I wear with this top, you can literally go into Pinterest and type in like, what to wear with this sequin top and it comes up with a whole bunch of ideas and chances are you have most of that stuff in your closet anyways it's just figuring out what works for your body type and your style and whatever event or day you're you're taking on and you used to travel a lot in in the corporate world before you started your business right Mm -hmm. yes I was a management consultant um in my previous job right before I quit uh for about three and a half years so I spent a lot of time on airplanes. I was literally traveling for the most weeks. Most of our clients weren't weren't in Toronto where I'm based. So I was on an airplane pretty much every single week for for almost three years. And that must have been a challenge if you're trying to look professional and you're you're having to travel and what to pack. And I know when people are traveling a lot they often don't want to check a bag so they're taking carry on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yes, I'm a devout carry on only traveler mainly because it saves you so much time at the airport. Um, and if you're traveling that frequently, you want to spend like the least amount of time possible in an airport environment. So I would literally roll into the airport probably about 30 45 minutes before my flight, and I had Nexus, uh, whatever it's called in the States, I think it's called Global Pass, um, where you can just get to the front of the security line and I'd be in and out of the gate. So it makes it really quick to move in and out of the airport. Um, but it also challenges you to get very creative with your wardrobe because um, you're working with a very small suitcase. Um, carry on, you know, generally restricts you on not only clothing items, but amount of like beauty products and, you know, the, the volume and size of those products as well. So you have to be very picky and choosy and intentional about your outfit. Um, one thing I found the most helpful for me. Um, both for personal travel and for um, traveling for work was to create and this is a major type A thing, but to create literally a spreadsheet and map out my week and say, okay, what am I doing for the next like four days in New York City? Okay, so I've got these four client meetings. Um, you know, Tuesday night I'm just going to stay in. Wednesday night we've got a client, you know, thing we're doing a dinner, so I need like a dress up outfit for that. And I literally map out my outfits and then challenge myself to kind of reuse things over and over again. And what I kind of found frustrating, I think, was with uh, my male colleagues, they could just wear, you know, the same suit and then switch out the tie or the shirt. So it was like very easy for them to travel light. And I find there's a stigma, um, particularly with women, that like we don't want to be seen in the same outfit twice. Uh, So we're always trying so hard to like mix and match and figure out different ways to wear, which is great. But that was really like the inspiration for Encircle. My clothing line was the idea if you can have a piece that transforms so it looks like you're wearing something different then you have like a big win there in my mind you have something that you can wear multiple ways and wear it a couple different times you don't have to worry about somebody saying oh she's wearing the same thing over and over again because um they would never know that's what fascinated me when I first uh, when I first discovered encircled my my daughter actually who Katie who just turned 27 she's been very passionate about sustainable clothing and ethically made mm-hmm. clothing and and uh, and we're in Vancouver and she had found a couple of places she was interested in but then she found your company and ordered uh, a pair of the dressy sweatpants and she was mm-hmm. working at the time as a, an executive assistant and um, and she, I think she lived in these <laughs> <laughs> in your yeah. in these mm-hmm. pants every time I saw her she was wearing them in different ways and I said what is going and she explained to me all <laughs> about it and and then I started following you on Instagram and and the first thing I purchased was the chrysalis cardi which mm-hmm. as you say it converts into so many different things and I thought this is mm-hmm. this is a bizarre and amazing at the same time <laughs> so how did you that is that that's the piece you started with isn't it yeah yeah so I, I designed that piece myself um that was the inspiration for the whole company basically and that came out of just finding a little bit about what I talked about that idea that you have all this stuff that you have to bring and it's not very functional and travel clothing and specifically 
is not known to be historically very stylish. Like you have your cargo zip off pants um, and stuff like that. But you don't really have travel clothing that looks very chic, especially five years ago. There was nothing like that. Really? So I wanted something that felt transformative, but also could be dressed up or dressed down. So um, I had one of those circle scarves from American Apparel back in the day that was like, you know, the 30 way scarf or whatever. And I actually took it with me on a trip to Costa Rica. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. I can wear this like dress. Or no, like so excited. And then I realized like you have to like tie it every time you want to wear it a different way. And it ends up looking like sack because it's like <laughs> so, like, it looks like a paper bag sack, basically. <laughs> and the fabric was see through. It was not even hemmed. So it was like fraying at the end. Like it was completely not practical. But I was very inspired by the concept of it, like the idea that something can do something. But I felt like they were really stretching there, making it do 30 ways. Like really, it had like maybe two practical ways to wear it. So I started thinking about like, what if I did something a little bit different? Like what if I figured out how to, you know, transform a scarf into a cardigan and it could just stay like that. People didn't have to like tie it or pin it. So that really inspired the Crystal Party, which uses a series of very high tension snaps to hold together the different looks. So you literally just snap together different configurations and there's eight in total that we recommend looks that we think are that we think work pretty well for most body types. And that was my genesis of my business basically. We only had that piece for the first couple of years and a couple of colors just selling it online and it became a very popular travel piece um, with bloggers and influencers and stuff like that because it is like very stylish and very flexible. Um, and it works for work travel or personal travel. So it really gives a lot of options to your wardrobe. And that is like the epitome, I think, of transformative apparel. Now we kind of tend to play in more of the space of like the dressy seconds where we're taking a play on something, you know, very comfortable silhouette, but making it something you can wear out at night and kind of that sort of idea of transforming from transitioning throughout your day. I was surprised to see the the and and when the sweatpant doesn't really do it justice because it doesn't look like sweatpants mm-hmm. the way I think of sweatpants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I I saw a picture the other day of someone wearing them with heels and I thought, "Oh, mm-hmm. that completely transforms my image of those pants. Like they looked fantastic." Yeah. Yeah, I wear them all the time. So whenever I have to go to like speaking gigs or conferences, like I don't own suits anymore. I gave away all my suits to charity when I quit my job so that I wouldn't go back. And uh, I always wear my dressy sweatpants and I put on a heel and then I will talk about them if I'm on stage or something like that. People will be like, oh, what's your sweatpants? Like, I believe it. Yeah. But like, they have to like touch and feel the pants because they're like, oh my God, because from afar it looks like a dress pant. But the secret of that pan is really the material that we're using. It's a sustainable plan. We did it here in Toronto. It's called Micromodal. And it's got four-way stretch, so it's super comfortable. But it's got a, like, a nice sheen to it. So it also looks like pretty dressy, um, but offers all those benefits of comfort. And those pants are like my favorite for sure. And they're definitely one of our best sellers. And they were also inspired by work because I, I was on a flight to like Brazil for 10 hours. And I was just like, you know, I just wish I was in a pair of pants that I could feel comfortable in, not these polyester panic, you know, things are digging into my stomach. So I just figured out, you know what, I'm just going to make a pair of pants that I would love to wear. And it kind of went from there. And so figuring out how to do that, were you a sewer or did you have friends who were sewers? I mean, how do you go about starting to make clothing if that's not what you were trained in? Yeah, so yes. So I have a finance degree and an MBA, so I have no sewing skills. My mother is actually quite a talented sewer. Just she loved doing it as a kid, and I have no skills. <laughs> like I remember touching her sewing machine once, and I broke it. Oh, no. So. <laughs> So yeah, so I'm basically not very inclined in that aspect, but what I did do initially, and I mean, five years ago, it was a little bit different now. I feel like with the gig economy, it's very easy to find people online to help you with a lot of this stuff, but I basically went to, there was a resource in Toronto called the Toronto Fashion Incubator. Um, It's funded by our city, and they have a bunch of resources, and I tried to find somebody who had some, like, design experience who could help me, like a technical designer, and I at least for the cardi, I figured it out largely on my own. I bought a sewing machine off Craigslist. I took a sewing class. I took an illustration class because I wanted to be able to 
at least somewhat draw something beyond a stick figure that looks like <laughs> what they wanted to make. Because that's like a very important step for design is to have that original illustration so that if you do have a technical designer, they can actually understand what you're trying to do and achieve and make a pattern from that. Um, so I did take an illustration course and I'm not a like master drawer by any like sense of the word right now, but it's definitely, I can get by with enough, I think, to, uh, to communicate my ideas. But yeah, I kind of just figured it out as I went and I didn't, I tried not to let anything stop me. I tried to get as educated as I could through reading books and blogs and stuff. But nowadays, like one of my favorite online business school coaches, Marie Forleo, she always said, everything is figure outable. And that is just like exactly the mantra that I follow. There were so many steps along the way where I didn't know what I was doing. And like contractors, so many contractors would like laugh at me or they'd be like, <laughs> you just must be so stupid, you don't know this. But I would ask stupid questions because I just didn't know, you know, and I just figured it out on the way and I tried not to let anything like really stop me. Um, I think anything, as long as you have a passion for it, you can teach yourself it or you can find people to help you uh, learn it or execute it. It's just more you have to feel that kind of interest and passion behind wanting to do that. And that's it. That's great for our listeners to hear, because I know there are a lot of people who are in career transition or who are stuck in a career they're not really happy with and maybe have an idea that's brewing. And Mm -hmm. to hear that you didn't have any experience in this and basically taught yourself and and learned as you as you went. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, did you imagine five years ago that you would be where you are today? (laughs) <laughs> no probably not because I was in like my dream job quote unquote like I was at the pinnacle of my career I was making more money than I ever made I was working for excellent like one of the top companies in the field um I was like on top of the world you know <laughs> basically left it all behind and it, I mean it's crazy and it was definitely very upsetting to a few people in my life maybe my parents um but and like when I started in circle I was like 31 32 so you know I was kind of not in my 20s so I wasn't like just you know playing around I had a serious 10 plus year career that I was like basically walking away from essentially it took me a couple years to get there but um I always encourage people to think about well I mean we spent so much time working so you really have to be doing something that you love like and I know that sounds really cheesy and I won't sugarcoat the fact that it's not, like, an easy road to get there. Like, definitely has had its ups and downs in the last five years. Like, as I mentioned, I was running part-time for probably about two and a half years uh, while I was working full-time in that job where I was traveling and working beyond the nine-to-five for sure. Wow. Um, so it was very stressful. And even the first year when I quit my job, like, you know, I was doing consulting on the side to try and make money. And I had to move apartments because I didn't have – I couldn't afford my rent anymore, like – it definitely was a very humbling experience, but um, I knew in my heart, I think I knew that if I stuck with this and I, you know, I guess you have that point where you, you kind of have to go all in or you have to go out, like, yeah. you can, like, just keep doing this side hustle forever, it, you know, it can only grow so far with you just part time. And I said, you know what, am I going to regret this in like 25 years if I don't do it? Probably. So let's just do it and see what happens. <laughs> Um, and the best advice I had was from one of my best friends who's a lawyer and she said you know you can always go back to consulting like nobody will judge you if you have to go back and and I said yeah you're right I won't be like scarlet letter on my head (laughs) she's an entrepreneur doing (laughs) but um yeah it's definitely a big transition for people and I I encourage people to always continuously look at you know, what fuels them and what has, what passions they have and how they can interact, integrate that more into their day-to-day career. I have so many questions. We're going to take a commercial break. And when we come back, I want to ask you about the ethical and sustainable piece and why that's important to you. So we'll be right back. You've updated your resume, you've sent it out, and you've been selected for an interview. Congratulations. And now you want to get ready, really ready. This is where Careers by Jen can help. We have a comprehensive online course called How to Ace a Job Interview When You Haven't Interviewed in a Long Time. This video-based course is jam-packed with information, advice, and exercises to help you get completely prepared to walk into an interview situation with confidence. From exactly what to prepare in advance, to how to answer common questions, to what questions you might ask the interviewer, and so much more, this course is designed to get you ready. 
Visit careersbygen.com and click on trading resources to see the curriculum, preview a couple of the introductory lessons, and see what others who have taken the course are saying about it. Visit careersbygen.com and get ready to ace your next interview. Hi, Careers by Gen listener. If you want to check out Encircled, you can go to careersbygen.com forward slash Encircled. That's E-N-C-I-R-C-L-E-D. Now, this is an affiliate link, which means that if you choose to make a purchase, I will earn a small commission. This commission comes at no additional cost to you. And please understand that I have experience with Encircled, and I really believe in what they are doing for the planet, for the human beings that make their products, and for the environment. Plus, I really love what I have purchased from them so far. So I recommend them because I'm passionate about what they stand for, not because of the small commissions I would make if you decided to buy something. So please don't spend any money on these products unless you feel the same passion and would like to try them out. And again, if you do, you can go to careersbygen.com forward slash encircled. And, uh, and find all of their products on their website there. You're listening to the Careers by Jen podcast with Jen Swanson. I'm talking with Christy Sumer from Encircled, and I wanted to ask you, Christy, about the sustainability of the, the fabric you mentioned, the, the modal fabric, and the ethical factor, and you're a certified B company, and I don't know what that means, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that <laughs> means and why this is important and was important when you started. Yes. So uh, we just became a certified B Corporation in March 2018. So a certified B Corporation is a third-party audited certification. Um, companies like Patagonia, Warby Parker, Eileen Fisher, Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream, they're all certified B Corps. There's uh, several thousand in the world. And basically what it is is the B Corp comes into your business and looks at all aspects of your business. So it's an audit to ensure that you're committed to using business as a force for good in the world. So um, they look at obviously like our sustainability efforts, our environmental processes. They look at our human rights, like our employee empowerment, how we pay our workers down to how we pay the CEO of the company. Um, They look at our supply chain, who we're purchasing from, who we're supporting, how they're being paid. Um, how we govern our company. There's so many different aspects to it. It's really hard to encompass into one, but essentially like it's embedded in our mission that we're committed to using um, our business as a way to improve the fashion industry and better human rights and better the environment with everything we do. Um, And that's something that has been very important to me from the beginning. I personally, from working in retail, so my sector that I work in, as a management consultant was retail and retail, um, retail fashion in particular is a very exploitive industry. Um, the supply chain is one of the biggest human rights violators in the world. It's the second most polluting, um, industry in the world, which is crazy. So uh, being aware of those facts and just myself personally, having traveled a lot and seeing the environmental impacts of, um, basically industrialization and capitalism on the planet, I just couldn't build a business without having it feel good and having it be built in a way that I think intrinsically would feel good for me as well as do good for the environment. I can't remember the name of the documentary. It's on Netflix. Uh, I watched it last year on the fashion, fast fashion industry and uh, horrifying, just horrifying the environmental impact and also as you said, the human rights impact, the, the, the moms that have to send their children away to be looked after and raised by other people so that they can live out an existence in a, in a factory sewing things mm-hmm. for us over here in North America. And, uh, and, you know, the hours that they work and the conditions they work in. And then the whole, you know, the Rana Plaza collapse. And mm-hmm. it's, it's something that I don't know that a lot of people think about on a daily basis. And so the fact that all, all of your stuff is made in your town, in your city mm-hmm. is, um, is different, isn't it? Yeah, it's very unusual <laughs> for sure. There's definitely, there's a stat that like 
I think in the 1980s, like something like 85% of apparel worn in Canada was made in Canada, and now it's less than 2%. Um, and it's very similar numbers in the States as well. So you've seen a lot of um, apparel manufacturing move overseas because duty regulations changed, um, which favored imported apparel. Um, obviously, like with wages going up here, there was more incentive to produce in lower wage countries where there was no minimum wage and no uh, worker regulations or anything like that. So, and you'll see that kind of today too, changing a lot. So a lot of apparel manufacturing initially moved to China and now China is actually becoming very expensive because they have a lot more controls in place for wages and, and human rights and unions and stuff like that. So you'll see most of the apparel manufacturing happening in countries now like Vietnam and Bangladesh and Cambodia, where there's very little worker rights and very little environmental regulations and stuff like that. So it's very sad that that kind of happens, that business kind of, the apparel industry just moves where it's cheapest and most exploitive um, because they're trying to make the, the most money essentially from each product and their whole business model, especially with fast fashion. And, uh, I think you're talking about the true cost documentary. That's right. Um, yeah, which is excellent. It's excellent. I wish more people would watch that because I think, just knowing changes people's mindset and it's so easy to just not think about it, not think about where that t-shirt came from and why it's $12, like, and how the people along the line must have been paid to make a t-shirt that was $12. It's better. It's easier for some people not to think about it, but the secret to fast fashion is they have to be cheap because they want to be fast. They want to be uh, quick to market. They want to be at a cheap price point. So everything down the line has to be, kind of skimped on whether it's like the fabric or the construction or the fit or how the workers are paid everything and the secret i think to sustainability when people ask me about sustainability i mean there's a lot of different ways to look at it and obviously like better fabrics is one thing but the most sustainable thing you can do is buy less clothing and wear the clothing that you own um, and the industry has kind of taught us that we need the newest new thing all the time like we need those floral patterned skinny jeans and then we need that neon like headband for one season and just that kind of like um very uh not I don't know what the right word is but very like transactional nature with our clothing and not having a lot of like honor for how it's made just I think in itself creates those conditions whereby it, it just fuels those fast fashion companies to do more of this kind of stuff so um, out in circles and there's a bunch of other ethical brands coming up that are along the same line we like to encourage people to actually wear their clothes and to buy their buy high quality clothes and yes that comes at a cost but if you buy one great t-shirt that you know you can wear for the next two years and you're going to wear it in love it's way better than buying like you know five that are going to fall apart after the first wash that you only get one season of wear out of so I always encourage people to think about cost per wear as a metric of like, you know, the value, the true value they're getting out of their clothing as well. And and I agree with that is buying the, the something that is of such good quality that it's going to be in your closet for the next five years or, or whatever. Um, and I've, I've always shopped. My, the majority of my closet has been secondhand consignment thrift store just mm -hmm. because of well, partly because of cost and because of the work that I have always done has been standing up in front of people. And so you have to look nice. You have to be dressed up. Mm -hmm. But I've recently started thinking, even though I'm buying this stuff secondhand, there's just too much of it. And mm -hmm. why do we need, you know, 15 skirts in the closet kind of thing when you mm -hmm. could get away with one or two? And, and so this whole idea of, even even if I'm buying it secondhand or occasionally buying something new, um, wouldn't it be better to have something that a closet that everything matched, everything went with each other or as much as you could, and that there were fewer things cluttering up the the closet? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. When you can actually see your clothes, you can actually see what you have and you actually can get more inspired to wear it I think and it challenges you more to get creative when you have less options to pick from I think um when you have a closet full of like 40 long sleeve tops it's like the possibilities are endless but it's also unnecessary in a lot of ways so 
I always encourage people to, you know, streamline their wardrobes as much as possible. We've got a great workbook that you can get when you opt in for our email newsletter on our website called the Minimalist Wardrobe Workbook. And literally it's a 16 page booklet where you can work through the process of streamlining your wardrobe, figuring out what you're actually wearing and challenging yourself to do more with less in your wardrobe. And I think that's really critical because I, I love like the idea of vintage and secondhand. I think that's a great way to integrate sustainability into your wardrobe. But I also agree, like we can't rely on that as the mechanism to always dispose of our clothing because it just becomes too much. There's nowhere else to put it. So um, there has to be a drop in consumption and kind of more mindful purchasing, I think, in the apparel industry by consumers. And they have to start to, you know, ask questions of the brands that they're purchasing from and really understand who's making their clothing and how they're being treated. I think that's really, really important. I think so, too. I, I fully agree with that. And I'm, I'm working on it. It really felt... There felt, I felt a lightning when I, this summer, took half my closet and, and donated <laughs> it. And really, and I thought, really, do I need this? Do it, you know, do I love it? Do I, mm-hmm. you know, that, <laughs> um, you know, do I love this? Does it bring me joy as that, uh, mm-hmm. I can't remember her name. Marie Kondo. That, yeah. yeah, Marie Kondo and yeah. her book. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there's so much space now. It's still not perfect it's not great but it's uh i'm working on it i'm working on uh, Mm -hmm. on finding things that can you know outfits that can do more than one uh, have more than one look as well and i think for work especially and and even if you do work in in the corporate world i mean there are ways to to do that without having to have you know six six separate suits or whatever Mm -hmm. yeah i totally agree it's all about like figuring out what works well together for you and designing kind of some core outfits that you know you can go to um, when you need to go to them. And and also kind of getting over yourself and the need to like have like a different outfit. I think also like I talked about that a little bit earlier, but we're always so concerned, I think, as, as women with like what we're wearing. We're usually concerned with what other women think about what we're wearing. Um, and kind of moving past that and realizing that most people aren't paying attention to what you're wearing on a daily basis. They're dealing with their their own issues and they're really in their head. So they're not thinking, oh my God, like Sarah wore that long sleeve top last week. How did or she like, you know, like but we've gotten that into our mindset because you know, fashion magazines would tell us that, you know, you should always have the latest and new thing. Whereas like I would say like for sure, you should be wearing that top at least once a week. Why not? You have it. You should definitely wear it. So I encourage people to spend time and, you know, whether it's on Pinterest or whatever mechanism works for them, and just, like, put together outfits they think that work for their body just so they have them as ready go-tos in the morning because nothing's worse than, like, staring in your closet and trying on 100 different things in the morning when you're trying to go to work. It just takes up so much time out of your day. <laughs> oh, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so hi. <laughs> I preach the other way. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, where can people find out more? I mean, I'm I've got a blog post I'm doing. I'm gonna post show notes, but where can people follow you? What can they find out? Yeah, so uh you can follow us. The best place to follow us is on Instagram. We're at encircled underscore. Uh, you can also follow me at Christy Sumer on Instagram. And then our main website is www.encircle.ca. And that's where we have our online store. We sell almost entirely direct to consumers. So um, we're big about the online experience and making uh, a lot of outfit inspiration and style inspiration possible for our customers on our website so that they can truly buy our pieces and actually wear and love them. Perfect. And what's your one last piece of advice for the listener, Christy? Always challenge yourself to do more with less. Think about um, if you were traveling for like 10 days to Paris and implement that mentality to your closet. Um, Try and challenge yourself to work with what you have versus over-consuming buying things that you'll never wear. That's great. Well, thank you for being here today. This has been fabulous. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Careers by Jen with Jen Swanson. If you like what you heard, please share this. You know, if every single person listening today shared this episode with just one friend, our audience would be twice as big just like that. And the more people we can help with our content, the better. 
So help out a friend and help grow our audience by sharing this show with someone you know who would benefit from the content. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that and together we can make a difference. Until next time, take good care.